It's not that hard to write an algorithm that shuffles an array. We can do it in place with something like a selection sort. The array will be divided into two sections. The lower section is the shuffled part, and it's initially empty. And the upper section is the set of the unshuffled cards, and the entire array is in the upper section at first. Then, in each step of the algorithm, a random element is selected fairly from the unshuffled part, added to the shuffled part, and erased from the unshuffled part. In a lower level sense, that is achieved by generating a random number to index the upper part of the array, a swap, and then an increment to the integer that tracks the division between the lower section and the upper section. Notice that at each step, each element has the same probability of being chosen. With that and a little proof work, we can see that each possible permutation of the array has an equal probability of being generated by this algorithm, and so this shuffle algorithm is fair. In this video, I'm going to look at another problem that's a lot harder, but looks very similar to the array shuffling problem on its surface. The motivation for this investigation initially came from my RPG simulator project. In that project, I'm simulating RPG characters that play out combat encounters and other events, and I was experimenting with ways of programming character behaviors. I had an idea that would involve having a set of behavior scripts and shuffling them so that each order of actions that could be played out was one of the possibilities. But I wanted to be able to encode some ordering constraints on those uh, behavior scripts. For instance, I wanted to be able to make a constraint like this. Behavior A1 comes before behavior A2. So then the question became, can I make a shuffle that will ensure that it gives an output that meets constraints like these? And is it additionally possible to ensure that each possible output has the same probability so that the shuffle will be fair? And it turns out by that, I stumbled into the problem of shuffling a partially ordered set, i.e. shuffling a post set. First, we need to know what a partial order is. A partial order can be defined precisely in mathematical language, and that would look something like this. A partial order is a relation denoted less than on a set X with the following properties. One, it is negasymmetric, which means that given elements A and B from the set X, if A is not the same element as B and A is less than B according to the relation, then it is guaranteed that it is not the case that B is less than A. And two, it has the pr transitive property, which says that given any three elements A, B, and C from the set X, if A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. To summarize, the first property means that if two elements go in one order, they can only go in that order and not also in the reverse order. And the second property means that we don't just think about order in pairs, but also as chains. And I love a nice clear mathematical definition, but especially when it comes with an example. Imagine a brand new deck of playing cards splayed out in front of you. They usually come in an order like the one I've shown you here. This is a total order. We can take any two cards and ask which one comes before the other, and we can always answer that question by examining this particular order of cards, and that's how this is a total order. And this particular total order is only special in the sense that it's a common default for a new deck of cards, but you could put the cards in any order you want. You could shuffle them in any way and splay them out, and you would get another total order. By contrast, a partial order will not necessarily assign an order for every pair of cards. A partial order might say something like aces come before kings within each suit and kings come before queens in each suit, etc., but then also say that cards of different suits don't have any particular defined order. A pair that doesn't have a defined order can be called an incomparable pair. There's a useful way to visualize a partial order as a directed graph. For example, here's the partial order I just described. Aces come before kings. Kings come before queens. If there's a path from one vertex to another in this graph, then the vertex at the beginning of the path comes before the vertex at the end of the path in the corresponding partial order. With this visualization schema, we should keep in mind that some edges in the graph are optional. Now, these graphs can't ever contain cycles because if they did, the corresponding partial order we would get from them wouldn't adhere to the property of negasymmetry, i.e. it wouldn't adhere to the property that a pair that comes in one order doesn't also go in the other order. By following the paths here, the ace comes before the king, but the king also comes before the ace. 
therefore this wouldn't be a visualization for a valid partial order. Okay, so we've got some tools, but now how does one solve the problem? It turns out that it's hard. If all you need to do is output a valid result, the problem becomes easy. That's a so-called topological sort, and we can do it in place with something like a selection sort. In each step of the algorithm, a maximal element is going to be selected from the post set and added to the end of the output array and eliminated from the post set. In order to select a maximal element, all we have to do is take one element and then scan all the other ones, and anytime we find one that is comparable and comes before the one we've currently selected, we change our selection to the more maximal element. But I don't want an algorithm that merely gives a valid output, I want a fair shuffle. I want each valid output to have the same probability, and that's what makes this hard. I'm sure there are a couple ways you could come up with to try to do this. Here's one of the ones that I did first to convince me that this was going to be hard. First, start with the topological sort. And when you select a maximal element, instead of just taking one of them, find all of them and then choose one of them randomly. We're assuming a fair random number generator is already possible, so this should be fair too, right? Well, no, just because we use a fair random number generator in the implementation, that doesn't mean the algorithm that we end up with is also fair. Here, take a look at this example. I've got five cards, Joker 2, 3, 4, 5. I put a partial order on them so that 2, 3, 4, and 5 have to come in order, but the Joker is left incomparable with all of the cards, so it can go anywhere. Now, it's pretty easy in this case to write down all the possible outputs by hand. It's just one possibility for each location the Joker can go in the output, and we then have five total places the Joker can go for five total possible outputs and a one in five probability for each legal output. Now, we can look at that side by side with what probability our algorithm gives to any one of the outputs in order to show that they do not match. In the first step of the algorithm that I proposed, the joker and the two are the two maximal elements, so there's a one-half probability of choosing either one. If we did choose the joker, then the output would have to be joker 2, 3, 4, 5. But if we chose the two, then the output would have to be any of the other outputs besides joker 2, 3, 4, 5. Therefore, this algorithm has a 1 in 2 probability of generating the output, Joker 2, 3, 4, 5, and so this isn't a fair shuffle. The problem here turned out to be that there are more legal outputs that start with 2 and less that start with a Joker. But we should be able to fix a problem like that by weighting the random choice, right? We would just need to know how many legal outputs can follow from each choice of maximal element. So that leads us to the problem of counting the number of permutations that are legal given a particular partial order constraint, and it turns out that that problem is hard, as in provably computationally hard. In a paper from 1991 by Graham Brightwell and Peter Winkler, it was proven that this particular counting problem is sharp p complete. Now this isn't about to become a video on esoteric complexity theory, so to put it simply, what that means is if we could actually count these with an efficient algorithm, then p would equal np and life as we know it would never be the same again. However, just because the related counting problem is computationally hard, that doesn't mean the shuffling problem is necessarily going to be just as hard. Still, whenever I hit a p versus np wall in the middle of an investigation like this, I get a clue that it's time to stop thinking it up all by myself and instead go see what the academic researchers have come up with so far. For some reason, it's the habit of every nerd to develop a strategy for discussing their favorite subject, which can ensure that only other enthusiasts will ever be able to understand what they're actually saying. I myself am as guilty as any other, as I've already thrown out some pretty nerdy jargon for you with post sets and direct graphs and all that. But the researchers working on this problem blow me out of the water by comparison. They call my problem, which again I call it shuffling post sets, they call it sampling linear extensions. Sampling here means choosing an element out of a set of possibilities. And a linear extension here is a total order that is compatible with a given partial order. And by the way, if it wasn't already obvious, each total order implies a specific permutation, and each permutation implies a specific total order, so they exist one-to-one -one as isomorphic concepts. So to fairly shuffle a set while observing a partial order constraint, which is how I'm thinking about the problem, is also to take a sample from the set of linear extensions on a partial order. An actual pro tip that I learned on this project is that when you don't know the right keywords to find the solution for your problem, 
but you believe your problem is already solved, then you should just ask GPT. It's probably going to lie to you in its answer, but when it does, it will lie to you using exactly the right jargon. And I hope you don't mind if I stick to my jargon for the rest of this video. Now, that same year, 1991, that it was proven that the counting problem is hard. Another paper proposed an algorithm for the fair shuffling problem. And there have been several more papers over the years since then that proposed improvements to that algorithm and also improved the bounds on the so-called mixing time of the algorithm. The version of the shuffling algorithm that I ended up implementing goes like this. First, a topological sort is applied to the post set. Then the array is shuffled by going over the array in passes. In each pass, there is an even subpass and an odd subpass. Even subpasses start at 0 and handle the pairs 0, 1, followed by the pair 2, 3, followed by the pair 4, 5, etc., etc. And odd subpasses start at 1 and similarly handle the pair 1, 2, then 3, 4, etc., etc. For each pair, if the two elements in the array could be swapped without violating the partial order constraints, then with a 50% probability we do the swap. It's kind of a strange looking algorithm with things like only swapping neighbors and doing things in even and odd passes and it's not obvious what makes this fair and it even seems like it's going to be biased in favor of the starting point if you shuffle this way, right? I mean, how many passes are you supposed to do to make this a good shuffle? Honestly, I haven't gone through the math in all of these papers to make sure that I could explain it thoroughly, but I'll give it to you in broad brush strokes. In these papers, the authors analyze the proposed shuffle algorithm as a Markov chain. Each legal permutation of the array is one state of the model, and the algorithm's update step gives a probability to transition to one of the other states. Then they are calculating upper and lower bounds on the mixing time of this chain. The mixing time is the number of steps it takes to ensure that all states have very close to the same probability. If you've ever heard the thing about how it takes seven rifle shuffles to completely randomize a standard deck of cards, this is the same idea. Another way to get an intuitive grasp of this phenomenon is to imagine a random walk in a finite space. If you let it run for long enough, eventually the starting point gets completely lost. You could end up anywhere. Now, in the case of shuffling a post set of n elements, with this algorithm, you can calculate the number of passes you need with this formula. It's gnarly looking, and it means this algorithm has a runtime of O n cubed log n, but I thought it was pretty cool that there is even a solution to this problem in the first place, and that it's not an exponential time solution. To test it out, I whipped up a quick implementation of this in C and used a simple test case and a slightly bigger test case, both of which took a while to run because I took a million samples and then put them into buckets to make sure all the buckets were getting roughly the same probability. Now the video is going to end here at a point where it kind of feels incomplete because there's really so much more we could dive into on so many fronts. But I wanted to make this much of the video and stop because I'm not sure what everyone who's watching might find most interesting. So let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear more about any of the following subjects. One, I could talk more about making a fair random number generator. It's not just about the pseudo random number generator part. There are other parts of fairness and time complexity concerns to talk about within that subject. Two, I could dive more into complexity theory. I could make sure everyone who's watching knows about P versus NP and what that really means. And I could talk about that sharp P complete class that we ran into studying this problem and how it relates to everything. Three, I could take a deeper dive into the Markov chain analysis techniques that are being used in these papers and explain more about them broadly, how Markov chains are used to model things like shuffling and other uh, random processes in order to create these kinds of algorithms. Four, I could talk more about how I took all of the parts I've already talked about and lowered them from abstract ideas to concrete C code to make the demo. Five, I could talk about more things I want to do if I'm actually going to use this in order to optimize the implementation and waste as little effort on this n cubed log n computation time. Or let me know if you have a different follow-up subject you'd like to hear more about. As for me, I'm going to continue working on this RPG simulator project that I mentioned. I haven't said much about it on this channel yet, although on my secondary channel with unscripted logs, I talked about it a little bit, and I'll talk about it more there. There's something about this project that has been really good for motivating me to explore other new ideas, and so I want to keep pursuing it, and I'll continue to drop little videos like this about the things that spin off from it from time to time. That's the end of the video. Thanks for watching. If you would be so kind, a like and a subscribe would be hugely appreciated. And if you like the projects I'm working on here, maybe consider supporting. All my projects are counting on support from viewers like you. And did you know that supporters are getting videos like these a week early now?
Check out other perks at mrfort.com slash membership. And with that, I'll see you next time. Bye.